So we're looking at moving math. What do you got here? Oh, well, here we are, round number 17 or whatever. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, about a week and a half ago, we had a situation where um, some of the kind of skill-based stuff that we've been doing with IXL, uh, the IXL site, we had a little issue with a subscription thing with the school, so we lost it for about two weeks. And in and amongst that, about, this, about the same time, a um, new company, near as I can tell, uh, MobyMath.com came out. And the difference with MobyMath is that it's still mathematical, it's still looking at skills and stuff. But whereas IXL, you really are assigning a skill to a group of kids, similar skill to all students, regardless of their proficiency or non-proficiency, and there is some flexibility to kind of go back grade level and move forward. Uh, the difference is, is we've got an app now that they have put together a, a program that's based on Common Core Standards, which we've found are adopted by 45 of the states. And Alaska standards are real similar to that Common Core, so we've got a pretty good structure there. But the difference is now is that with um, Moby Math, that a student will come in and they'll basically take a diagnostic test looking at a knowledge base in alignment with these Common Core standards from kindergarten through eighth grade. And then based on that, um, it makes an initial placement. And so we can kind of see some initial placements on my students here. Uh, and interestingly enough, I see placements anywhere from the middle of second grade to a student that was initially placed at a sixth grade level. And if we kind of dig into one of these, and you know, we'll dig into one kind of right in the middle, here's a student that was placed at a 4.2 level. The initial information we get once it kind of runs its little analysis is we actually can look at how that student placed based on standards from kindergarten. So in this case, all the kindergarten sta standards are met. First grade, they're all met. But then we suddenly see in second grade, there's some standards that haven't been met. And operations are good, numbers are good, but when we get down to measurement, which we all know from common classroom use, measurement's kind of a tough thing. And sure enough, the student gets everything except a standard that talks about solving word problems using money. And if we want a little more detail, they've uh, actually gone through and listed this stuff. So we can actually see exactly what the standard is up here. And then with that, it's telling us that they're going to run through some lessons and practice sets where money up to a dollar and then money and word problems, five dollars, five dollar word problems. And so in this case, this is a student that this is a standard that they, in that prescriptive test, that diagnostic, they didn't meet. Well, tremendous amount of information here, and I don't really want to scroll through this, because really the question is, what standards is Moby Math saying they're not meeting? So they've got a missing standards tab here, where it throws out all the stuff they do know, and we're left with, here's the stuff they need. So a little bit of second grade stuff, some third grade stuff, um, enough third grade stuff and fourth grade stuff that they have obviously put this together in some form to say that in her case she's at a 4.2 level. And so we've got a fifth grade classroom. We would really hope that in an ideal world that we'd see all these kids that are ready at a fifth grade standard. That would make sense. But again, we see kids that are significantly behind and some that are quite advanced from there. And so once that placement takes cap, place. Um, the app, the program gives me this snapshot at all times where I can see information about the last time they were on, how many minutes they spent, uh, whether this happened in the school context in terms of our, our hours, whether it's happening at home, approximate amount of time that they were involved, how many different uh, lessons they've finished. They get individual scores for every lesson. So if I see a lesson like for this kid here, he got a 35 on it, which of course isn't a passing score, but interesting that he's working on a drill that he's reducing fractions to prime factorization. And we can kind of see that, and I'm looking at his incorrect answers, he's got this idea of reducing, but he's just not quite reducing the right things. And so I'm guessing from what he did, 
he crossed out one more set of primes to end up with the 2 over the 3. And, you know, so, you know, in terms of a, a drill reduction of fractions like this, this is kind of a end of fourth grade, beginning of fifth grade drill. He's having a little difficulty. And so it's going to kind of keep working on him with that until he gets to this point where he's starting to show. And so prime factorization is an issue. So here's a different drill asking for the prime factors of a number. And, you know, you can see he put a 2 in there. And I think what he did is he said 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 gets me my 8. So, you know, a little bit of thing. But again, from our curriculum, prime factorization was just introduced. So this seems like a fairly appropriate place. And it's interesting, too, up here I can see that it took 7 seconds. He spent 7 seconds on this question, mm -hmm. which almost tells me that He's probably rushing this a little bit faster than he should because that's quite a bit of multiplication for a kid to do in their head. And maybe he was doing it on paper, I don't know. And so I can actually see how much time they spent in the last one, the scores they achieved. It also has a, a fact mastery segment to it. And so I, as the administrator, the controller, the teacher, whatever we want to call it, I actually can individually tell this student needs to spend 10 minutes on facts before they get into the, the drills. Or if this kid has shown me that they've got mastery, I can just skip those all together. Um, global settings versus individual settings. And, and I'm starting to see a lot of the kids are getting through that. So once they get those 100%, we really want them moving on to other math. We don't need to keep doing 2 plus 3 over and over and over, and over again. Um, How do you define the app not in school time? Can you well, decide when yeah. it can, it's considered working at home? And this is, again, one of the beautiful things about this, because one of the settings I set has to do with setting what we would consider homework. And I, I would think it's more like in school versus out of school. Okay. So if a student is involved in an after-school program, that's really out of the context of the instructional day. And so, you know, I said in Alaska time, we go to school from 9 to 3.30, so literally if a kid goes home at 3.35, they're on, that's considered home practice. Even if they sat in school in an after-school program, right. that's home. As yeah. soon as that 3.30 trips, it kind of trips into that other, that's, that's cool. other preference there. And so basically what happens is, you know, when a kid logs on, and probably the easiest, you know, thing to do this is I'll just go into my roster and I'll just create a new student. So we can kind of see that. So I can set, you know, obviously an initial grade. And, you know, here we have our test student. And it creates a username and a password. And so I have a new student involved. And so when this student logs on, and I'll kind of log out of my mode, um, students logging on as a student, they have to pick their school. And so we'll go find our school. And this is our student name, test and test. And so the first time a student logs in, and again, this is another feature of this program, because I can actually make them take this diagnostic test as frequently as I want. So if I get a, a kid with a score that seems inappropriate, uh, doesn't kind of match what I've been doing in school, and so, you know, this is the first time they're trying to figure out, you know, prescriptively, what do I need to work on? What do I know and don't know? And so another feature of this that is just so powerful 40, 50, fill is in the blank, notice 70, if count by tens I have reading issues blank, or 30, things, 40, I don't want 50, reading to stand in the way of mathematical blank, knowledge. 70. So this will read it to them. And so, you know, I come in and let's say I know this one. Alan had two pennies and found three more. How many pennies does Alan have now? And what's kind of nice about this is this may seem pretty easy to a fifth grade student. The number 13 has one but ten. From our initial exposure to this, we're finding some standards that even as fifth grade students that are good students, there's little things that just didn't quite get cemented into their into their minds in quite the way we want. Which is longer, the kangaroo or the dinosaur? And so we're, we're going to kind of make some mistakes here just to. And notice one mistake that's going to kick us there? out. What do these two shapes form when brought together? 
And again, if I'm not able to read that. Rectangle. And so we'll we'll make a couple more mistakes. What here. is this shape? Adam earned two points in the first round of competition. In the second round. Fill in the blank. And I'll just blast through this right now. And seventy one. Because I'm not sure how many it equals takes to kick them how out. many tens. What time? Maybe how many bears tallest? Well, it took anywhere from the 10 square to has been divided in two. So, yeah. yeah. So I. Th Which I shape think is what it's doing is it is really sitting there and it's hitting all these different standings, the little pieces there. Mm -hmm. Two plus three so equals. So here's some math facts that are coming. And so, see, I've done enough. So, what happens is once we've done this diagnostic... Are you ready to start your new lesson? And so, based on how I answered the questions, it is now ready to start a lesson with me. And so... Start with measurement. Could you so, it started with measurement because I missed a measurement one. Well, you know, which ruler is longer? So, you know, I see that. And now what's kind of nice about this is my time's up. You know, I've got to do something else. Notice there's some hints that they build in here so that there's a little bit of assistance along the way. But if I log out now, and I'm going to go back in this now administratively as the teacher involved here. Here's that test student. So... Grade level K, I showed 60% first grade, boy, 1% mastery. And so now it's really asking me, you know, first lesson is going to be a measurement, one which we saw. And do I want to automatically assign facts or do I want to manually assign them or not assign them right now? So I'm going to go with automatic just because it seems to be pretty accurate. And so we now come down and... My test student, he's going to be mixed in here somewhere. So here's my student test on the 12th of October. I've actually not completed any time. But if we actually look at this student test, we can see that he's got 60% of mastery at kindergarten. But that's, that's about it. Mm -hmm. And then if I really want to see what's in there, you know, I can see that counting, he did pretty good operations numbers, but boy, the measurement, zeros everywhere, zeros all the way down. And so it kind of makes sense that that's the standard we want to go at. Um, once a student's been involved in this for a while, we can actually go to this progress tab. And the nice thing about the progress tab is we, we get quite a bit of information. We actually see an in, uh, a beginning grade level and an ending grade level. So I can see with this student that they've shown a, a tenth of a year increase. They've passed two standards. This learning velocity is if they go at this pace, how much growth will they show in a year? Um, and just after a week and a half, I've got you know, kids that are showing 0 0.8. I've got some that are they're here. If they keep going at this pace, they, they might show four years growth. And we realize that you know, with a, a week and a half's worth of data, we need a month, we need two months to really see some of this balance out. But if I you know, pick on one of these kids, so here's the kid that's got 3.9, I mean, that's looking amazingly wonderful. And all of a sudden I start getting a summary of how much time he's spending each session. So he's averaging 55 minutes a session. He's, this focus is very interesting. The program kind of senses you know, there's a time of how long should it take and you know, is this kid signing on and then watching TV and kind of claiming their minutes. Um, we can see already he's made a half year's growth just by plugging a few holes and past 22 standards. We can actually see the progress that kindergarten he was at 100%, second grade 75, now he's at 100. So a few of these standards that he didn't have, he's taken care of. And I'm willing to bet, you know, with another couple of weeks, you know, he'll clearly, we'll start seeing sixth grade standards start showing up. And for those that like the graphs, you know, so here in eight days, started at 4.4 up to, you know, 4.9. And then if I want to, I can, there's also these progress reports. So I can actually print this stuff out or whatever the case is. So here's the missing standards we're at now. So there's really only one thing left in third grade. 
has to do with a little bit of fluency, which there's going to be some speed involved in that kind of stuff. And is there any sort of reporting? I mean, you just you just showed progress reports. Can right. parents peek into this at any level? I don't have a parent account right now. Okay. Of course, I've always stressed with my kids and parents, if the kid has an account, you have an account. And right. they really, I really stress this idea that children need to be responsible to show their parents, this is what I'm doing, this is how I'm, I'm going about this. Um, boy, in terms of lessons with this kid, I can go back and see every lesson that he's completed, the scores, the dates that he did those on. And it's just amazing to me. We're going from place value notation, you know, to subtraction strategies, to calendar skills, to, you know, Roman numerals and quadrilaterals. And to try to do that in a class of 28 individualized, that just, we dream of that, but it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, if I need to, I can actually go in and specifically assign lessons to a student. So, for example, if the Moby's telling me that they've got mastery, but in normal classwork, I'm noticing I'm not seeing that demonstrated on a daily basis, I can actually go into a grade level, you know, fourth grade, and say, you know, your proficiency, you know, may be 100 here, but we're going to go do that again. We're going to go assign that, that segment of, mm -hmm. of stuff back just to kind of kind of force that issue. Mm -hmm. So I could, you know, prescriptively, if I knew in my next, you know, curricular unit of study that we're going to spend a lot of time on fractions and I want to kind of preload the kids, I can begin assigning those, even though it may not be diagnostically accurate, but it's kind of preloading some information sure. so that hopefully we, we see that come out and that, you know. And then, and they keep going because I can actually sequence these things too. So if I assign 10 lessons, I can actually determine what order I want them to go through. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty good. And then the last thing, and, and you know, whoever thought of this, they, they, they truly get it. They truly get this idea that not all students are the same, that kids have different knowledge bases, and we really should be teaching to the kid versus to a generic standard that exists. Mm -hmm. And so they have this last section here for IEPs. Um, which would be a very interesting um, thing to do. So, you know, for example, if I had a kid that had an IEP, I could actually go in here and match up IEP standards with the standards that are present in this Common Core. And if I do that, I can actually check the box and then I can actually see a report. How are they doing on that specific standard as designated in an IEP mm -hmm. so that I can actually produce you know, something that, you know, I guess mathematically without that human subjectivity in there saying, well, if the standard was they need to be able to count from 1 to 10 accurately, well, here's several standards and how are they responding to those? And even greater so, I could assign those specific drills and lesson sets. And so, you know, what it comes, is, comes down to is, you know, um, I've got a group of students, and I think this will work for any. It's a pretty highly motivating program. I don't worry about this, somebody else doing the work for them because they're all doing different lessons. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of, I've taken the approach that this has become what math homework is to me. I'd much rather kids go home and work on skills that they need on a level that's appropriate for them. Um, and so I just set a standard of 180 minutes of math a week. And then they've got a week to do that and then we can come in and I can actually you know, look at the snapshot and, you know, how much did they do this day, that day. You start seeing patterns of when students work at home, which is, you know, here centered around what hockey season's going and soccer season. And, well, if this is that three-day weekend we went to Anchorage, um, we have found so far this runs on every platform that we can find. Um, the iPads, once in a while they seem to get stuck. I think that's more a result of our, our school district's network because all the testing I did at home, it's never gotten stuck. I've never seen, you know, it's kind of almost like the data's just not flowing. And mm -hmm. sometimes our network gets pretty, pretty full. Um, one suggestion I'd make to the company, and I've already sent this in, is it'd be kind of nice if they could track what operating system, what browser is actually being used. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing that when you look at um, Google, if you have a, a web blog, you can actually see what operating systems are, are tagging that. 
You see how many people are doing on mobile devices. Right, for and, and I think we're going to find out there's a lot of these that are being done as kids are riding in the car to go somewhere and they're back there on a phone or whatever the device is. Or, and it'd be kind of just an interesting perspective to me to see is this really requiring the home computer or is really the main operating platform mobile in nature yeah. because I think that's where it's all going anyway. So, And all these, everything I've shown you, we could print out any of this stuff. So they've built, built a print feature into all this kind of stuff so I can, you know, constantly, you know, be printing, you know, do I want this, you know, do I want it as a PDF. The export, I can dump it out so that I've got standard, you know, Excel kind of information so I can so that that's Moby Math. It's just one more little arrow in the quiver, and, <clears throat> and what we're finding is with our our district mandated curriculum, that's stuff that you know I can teach in a large group context in class. Um, IXL, we then use that as here's a skill that I need practice in connection with that curriculum, and again that's stuff that happens at school. A lot of kids still do that at home because they're trying to work ahead, and now I've got this last little thing that gives me some very diagnostically accurate prescriptive mm -hmm. so hopefully by the time you go through a year we don't have kids moving on that they might have good math knowledge but somewhere in there they just never quite got how mm -hmm. Roman numerals work mm -hmm. which comes back and it just kind of hits them later on right. and it's pretty hard to um, you know address that one-on-one -on -one, you know if you're teaching you know a seventh grade math class mm -hmm. with 32 kids or something so